Mary Montgomery is an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and staff physician in the Division of Infectious Disease at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Montgomery cares for HIV infected patients and broader infectious diseases in both the inpatient and outpatient setting. She's also very involved with medical education at Harvard Medical School, both directing the internal medicine sub-internship and co-directing the clinical skills course. Dr. Montgomery will present a clinical case titled, Challenges in Treating Complex HIV Patients. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I will be discussing a clinical case that highlights some of the challenges in treating complex patients. I have no conflicts of interest. So for our case, it's a 29-year-old man who was perinatally infected with HIV at birth, and he comes in for follow-up. He was previously followed uh, in New York City and was in and out of care and just moved to Boston, Massachusetts, here in the United States. He unfortunately has struggled to take his medications for as long as he can remember. Unfortunately, in adolescence, he started gagging on his pills, and that's really not gotten any better, and that issue has persisted for him. He also uh, comes today because he's been losing weight and he thinks that he has thrush again. He also is in a new relationship and hoping to get back on his medications, uh, partly for his partner. He thinks he's taken pretty much every HIV med under the sun, he says. He can remember AZT, D4T, tenofovir, FTC. He remembers efavirenz, severapine, ropivirine, adizanavir, darunavir, and most recently he thinks he was on raltegravir. You obtain uh, labs, and unfortunately, uh, not surprisingly, his viral load is over 300,000 and his CD4 count is 89. You uh, obtain an HIV genotype and also obtain all of his HIV genotypes from his prior care in New York City, and you see the below mutations. He has multiple NRTI mutations, including M184V and two TAMs, 41 and 215. He also has three NNRTI mutations, one protease mutation, 84V, and one integrase mutation, 155H. You also look through his records and see that he had prior viral tropism testing, which showed dual mixed virus. He reiterates to you that he really struggles to take pills and that he wants to get back on his medications, but he wants the least amount of pills possible and the smallest pill. He also tells you that he hates taking boosters such as ritonavir and cobacistat as they give him nausea. Before we move on with this case, I wanted to just uh, speak briefly about the care of HIV adolescents here in the US. Uh, unfortunately, here in the U.S. and many parts of the world, uh, the, uh, HIV adolescents really struggle uh, to take their medications. You can see here in 2017, there were 50,000 patients in this country living with HIV uh, that were between the ages of 13 and 24. Only about 50% of them knew they had it, and unfortunately, only 30% of them were virally, virologically suppressed. And this is what I see in my panel here in Boston, Massachusetts. Unfortunately, the patients in my panel that struggle the most with taking their medications, who have the most HIV resistant and often have the most opportunistic infections due to poor biologic suppression are my perinatally infected patients. And this is for a multitude of factors. Uh, many of them grew up around 30 years ago when the care of HIV was quite complicated. And in order to suppress their virus, they would have to take 10, sometimes 15 pills at a time. This would be challenging for anyone and particularly challenging for them as they en then entered adolescence, where it's normal as an adolescent to rebel against everything that the adults tell you to do. This led often to HIV uh, resistance and more mutations. Unfortunately, many uh, perinatal infected patients also uh, struggle with multiple, multiple social barriers, such as poverty. Many of them are orphaned as their parents died of HIV. Uh, there are high rates of substance use, homelessness, and unfortunately, also uh, significant stigma. So as a result, uh, this case is uh, really emblematic of many of the patients that I have in my panel and that live in this country and the rest of the world who have uh, prominent uh, HIV uh, resistance. So let's actually go through his resistance mutations. And it can be daunting and challenging to look at someone's uh, genotype and to see all these mutations and to try to figure out what to use. 
And many of you probably know about this, but I wanted to highlight this wonderful resource out of Stanford that is free to everyone, and I've included the link down below, where you can enter in a patient's uh, mutations, and it'll then populate a very clear chart where it tells you which drugs uh, are affected by those specific um, resistance mutations. So here is the, are the resistance mutations for our patient. You can see NRTI and NRTI mutations are listed here. He has 41 and 215, which are TAMs, which infer resistance to multiple NRTIs, uh, and uh, including uh, low-level resistance to tenofovir. And then he has M184V, which uh, leads to high-level resistance to enterocytobine and lamivudine. But surprisingly, uh, the recommendation is to continue this drug because it uh, uh, ensures a less virologically fit virus, and patients seem to do better even in the face of M184V. It also actually increases susceptibility to tenofovir. He also has three NNRTI mutations, which you can see here lead to low, intermediate, or high-level resistance. Protease and, uh, mutations, he has one, 84V, which infers resistance to multiple uh, protease inhibitors, and low-level resistance here to darunavir. He also, unfortunately, has a dreaded integrase mutation, uh, 155, which often uh, develops from failure on elvitegravir and raltegravir. And in our patient, this likely was when he failed raltegravir therapy. This infers low-level resistance to bictegravir and dolutegravir. He also had viral tropism testing. And viral tropism, as you remember, is the way that the HIV virus, which receptor it uses uh, to attach to CD4 cells. It can either use a CCR5 receptor, CXCR4, or uh, use both of them. And in our patient, uh, he has dual tropic virus, so using both receptors to attach to the CD4 cell. So now that we have talked a little bit about what his mutations mean, which ARV regimen would you start? Would you start a single tablet pill of bictegravir TAF-FTC? Would you start a single tablet pill of darunavir copacis TAF-FTC? Would you start twice daily darutegravir with TAF-FTC? Would you start an, another drug, Maraviroc, darutegravir twice daily and darunavir twice daily? Or finally, would you start twice daily darutegravir, twice daily darunavir and TAF-FTC? So we'll come back to this after we dive a little bit more into his resistance. Uh, and first, I want to take a pause and really talk about some of the key principles of virologic failure. This is not an exhaustive list, but some of the key ones. One of the most important things is that when you have a patient with virologic failure, we want to check resistance while they are still on uh, that failing regimen. You also want to ensure that you obtain all of the resistance records uh, in their past. So that means calling previous clinics that they've gone to, asking patients to help track those down for you. And in the best case scenario, you want to treat biologic failure with at least uh, two and preferably three active drugs. When there is partial resistance to darunavir and dolutegravir, these are drugs that we actually dose twice daily, unlike many other uh, HIV medications. So let's hear are all of his resistance mutations on one slide. And you can see here I've highlighted with the blue arrows that he has low-level resistance only to tenofovir, low-level to darunavir, and low-level uh, to dolutegravir. So let's unpack these options here. So you would not want to use bictegravir taf ftc for two reasons. One, he already has one integrase mutation, so you don't want to solely rely on that. And we also, it's not recommended yet to use bictegravir uh, and when someone has integrase mutations because we don't yet have as much information about its use in this situation as we do darutegravir. For the same reason, we would not want to use solely darunavir given that he has one uh, darunavir mutation. And uh, similarly, even though we're dosing darutegravir twice daily, you would still want another agent since he does have one integrase mutation. Maraviroc, unfortunately, will not work as this is a CCR5 antagonist and would not work in the setting of his dual tropic virus as his virus also uses CXCR4 to attach to the CD4 cells. And then finally, the last option, although not perfect, is probably our best in this situation if he's willing to take it. Darutegravir twice daily, darunavir twice daily would help to overcome that low level resistance that's seen for both of those drugs and we would continue TAF-FTC. Um, since he uh, just has two TAMs and M184V. 
So let's see what happens in our case here. So a month later, he comes back to clinic and he says, it's been incredibly hard to take this amount of pills, but he feels that he is very motivated both for his partner and his partner has actually helped him to take the pills. Uh, he also has pill, box, pill boxes that have been very helpful and he knows then what to take exactly in the morning and what to take at night. And he's been taking them about five to six times per week. You repeat his labs and see now that his viral load is down to 1,200 copies per milliliter. And you schedule a repeat visit in one month for another uh, viral load and CD4 count. Unfortunately though, he misses that next visit and the clinic and you are unable to reach him over the last nine months, despite multiple phone calls and patient letters. He does then call and come back requesting a clinic visit nine months later because he now has thrush and difficulty swallowing and new profound diarrhea. You learned that soon after your last visit, he broke up with his partner. And since then, he's been very depressed, has struggled to take his meds. And when he can take them, it has been impossible to take them twice a day. So if he does take them, he's just taking them once a day. His repeat labs, not surprisingly, unfortunately show a viral load of over 200,000 and his CD4 count has dropped to 44. You repeat HIV resistance testing and it shows the same resistance profile as before, although highlighted in red here, you can see he's now developed 148, which is another integrase uh, mutation that can develop on diretegravir therapy, most often if in someone who already has another uh, uh, mutation. And you can see here that when that's entered into the Stanford database, he now has intermediate resistance to dolutegravir. This unfortunately is the bind and where before we often had very few options for patients that came to this uh, situation. He has low level resistance to tenofovir and darunavir and intermediate resistance to dolutegravir. And as you've heard about earlier, we fortunately now have other uh, HIV treatment options in our toolbox. And I wanted to briefly mention three of these in our advanced, uh, uh, for advanced HIV treatment. So the first is not a new drug, but it's something we do uh, occasionally use in someone uh, who has advanced HIV disease and very few other options. And that is something called enfuvertide, which is a fusion inhibitor. The unfortunate part about enfuvertide is that it has to be given twice daily as a subcutaneous injection. And patients very uh, struggle immensely to do this, and it can lead to welts uh, in the area where they do the injections in some, in some patients. A newer drug that was just approved is ibilizumab. And as you've learned, this is a post-attachment monoclonal antibody that uh, is given as an every two week infusion. So for this, someone either has to have an indwelling line, which comes with multiple complications and risks, uh, or more often they have to be able to get to an infusion center or a clinic every two weeks for this injection. And then finally, most recently approved was fostemzivir, which is an HIV entry inhibitor. And this is a twice daily pill. And so uh, for our case here, we've kind of come to uh, a place where you need to start thinking about these advanced HIV treatments. And that has to do with uh, resistance testing and it also has to do with discussions with the patient. You know, what are they willing to do? What is more feasible? Uh, you know, would you try fostemsevere, uh, you know, which is a pill, ibilizumab, would that be easier in terms of infusion? And this is a much more uh, kind of complicated decision uh, when you get to this point. And so I wanted to add on two final key principles for virologic failure. And that is that often the mainstay of therapy are uh, protease inhibitors and integrase inhibitors. And when those fail, and when you no longer have those as active agents, that is when you're starting to think of advanced therapy, which is most likely fostemsevere, ibilizumab, and rarely T20. And I wanna leave you with probably the most important message of today is that you want to try to use non-stigmatizing language when you ask patients about adherence. I used to ask patients in my clinic, how many days did you miss your pills? And instead, the HIV social worker in our clinic uh, taught me about a different way to ask about uh, adherence, which is less stigmatizing. So now I say, gosh, it sounds like you've got a lot going on in your life. How many days a week are you actually able to take your pills? 
it then gives them the opportunity to say, actually, I'm able to take them four days a week. I'm actually able to take them five days a week. And you then said, great, that's amazing that you're able to take it five days a week. What do you think is getting in the way of you taking it those other two days? And then it leads to a discussion about the barriers that are impeding their care. You're taking away that stigma, you're taking away that shame, where it's very hard to answer, well, I'm missing them you know, three days a week, I'm missing them two days a week. And instead you're really highlighting and congratulating them for the five days that they are taking it and working to figure out how they can take it more. So today, hopefully uh, I've highlighted for you uh, a patient who has profound uh, uh, treatment of virologic failure and multiple resistance mutations uh, and try to describe for you some of the key principles when we take care of patients with virologic failure. Thank you again for the invitation to speak.